My name's Rob Holt and I'm an engineer on the PowerShell team. And in this talk, uh, we're going to go into some pretty heavy detail on the PowerShell module system. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, but first, uh, thanks to the sponsors of PSConf EU this year. Um, so what are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to talk about how modules are picked up from the uh, file system and how they're loaded into memory. Um, Modules have scopes, and so we're going to go into some of the uh, intricacies and mechanisms by which module scope works. Um, how commands get resolved from modules without the module itself being loaded, and how uh, auto loading works. And finally, how you remove modules from uh, your PowerShell session. But first, what are modules exactly? Well, they're a reusable unit of functionality. Uh, some self-contained set of functions uh, and you know, commands that can be run from PowerShell. Um, so that means that since they're self-contained, modules can be installed from somewhere else, loaded into your session, used to do whatever it is you need to do, and then unloaded and uninstalled, um, all without having adversely affected uh, you know, the, the greatest state of your system. Um, we won't cover installation and uninstallation in this talk, uh, but see Amber Erickson from also from the PowerShell team's talk about PowerShell GET uh, for information on um, the sort of off-box uh, side of the module story. Um, so modules, another aspect of modules is that they usually have some focus. They usually, uh, a single module usually uh, contains functionality around some feature, uh, on a machine or some domain or area. You know, there's the PowerShell module for Teams. There's uh, DISM, which uh, manipulates uh, things like Windows images. Um, there's um, PowerShell modules tend to uh, tend not to uh, have many components doing different things, but tend to be like, uh, well, they're similar to an API uh, or an SDK. Uh, you know, you might get and set something with two different commands. Um, and so in that sense, PowerShell modules behave like, um, you know, packages, libraries, SDKs in other languages. And other languages have modules too. Um, so PowerShell modules traditionally provide commands, but they also provide things like formatters, providers, um, type uh, PowerShell type uh, information, um, even .NET types, uh, and other things beside. Modules are quite uh, can be quite a mixed bag in terms of what they uh, bring into a PowerShell session once imported. Um, but most importantly, I think modules are a very core element of PowerShell. Almost everything of use that is done in PowerShell is done with a module or with the commands that come from modules. Um, and most of PowerShell's other functionality is effectively glue uh, to make calling into these module commands easier. And because of all this sort of, you know, lot, the power of modules and things like that, they're designed to be invisible. They're designed to not get in the way of you doing the work that you need to do with the module. Um, and, and that's kind of interesting because it informs a lot of the mechanisms uh, a lot of the links that PowerShell goes to to keep modules sort of working quietly behind the scenes rather than forcing the user to think about them too much. So I think from this point, I really, oh, sorry. Um, so here's a good example of um, uh, a, a PowerShell module um, providing, that, that provides a lot of functionality. It's one of the core PowerShell modules, Microsoft.PowerShell.Utility. And you can see from the get command command that um, a lot of commands in PowerShell come from this module. And in fact, um, kind of contrary to my earlier point, they're kind of diverse commands, but they all have a commonality, which is they are common utilities that you might have use for in a day-to-day -day PowerShell environment. And so just a single module provides a lot of quite powerful functionality um, uh, and, and that's provided from the module to PowerShell through the module system. So one natural question I think is, 
why does PowerShell have modules at all? It's a shell, right? And other shells like CMD and Bash don't need modules at all because instead they just have utilities and utilities uh, are just files on the file system. And so when you want to uh, 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 execute a utility, all you do is you find the file and you uh, invoke it. Uh, you start a new process from that utility uh, or that executable, um, passing in some arguments. But PowerShell uses live objects and it's built on .NET and those live objects are .NET objects. And so it's not enough to invoke something as a utility in a new process because new processes, uh, because these live objects don't survive the process boundary. Instead, PowerShell has to run commands uh, on, uh, and uh, functionality from within its own process. Um, and that requires um, uh, DLLs, .NET code to execute. But DLLs don't represent a single command, a single executable. Um, they are libraries, dynamic, uh, dynamically linked library. And so a PowerShell module naturally, but based on a DLL exporting commandlets is also a library. But from the beginning in PowerShell, this was accomplishable as a concept. We had snap-ins. So What's wrong with snap-ins? Why do we have modules now? Why didn't we just have um, snap-in? Why didn't we just persist with snap-ins? Well, maybe we'd like to also write our modules in PowerShell. If we can't write modules in PowerShell script, then PowerShell is a second class language within itself. Um, but again, arguably, we could already do this. It's very easy to write a PowerShell script that defines a set of functions and to simply dot source it in. So again, what's wrong with that? Um, well, the problem is that dot sourcing doesn't really separate the script from the context that it is brought into. There's no concept of internal or external. Um, and so um, there's no way to uh, simplify the surface area of uh, a dot source script. More than that, <laughs> Um, it's not a unified surface area with a snap-in. Dot sourcing and snap-ins are very different concepts. Um, and having to execute uh, your PowerShell file uh, means, uh, sorry, having to dot source a PowerShell script uh, or having to load a snap-in means that it's very hard for a human to determine what, the, what that's going to export. And so we'd much prefer that a module, uh, an ideal PowerShell module as a concept, um, have this separation and be human readable so that I can look at something in the module that says what it's going to export ahead of before I load it. Um, and so uh, that's good for humans. It's also good for PowerShell. Analyzing a snap-in, analyzing uh, a PowerShell script file is hard to do even for a computer um, uh, and often requires loading or executing code. And so we'd like something else that does this. Um, and so uh, a natural uh, solution is this sort of unified concept of PowerShell modules, a unified uh, entry point for uh, modular code, um, which we're going to look at uh, in, in a second. I should say that um, historically speaking, PowerShell has modules for none of these reasons so much as because um, PowerShell was built uh, as a sort of halfway point between a shell and a structured programming language. And at the time, Perl was another tool that really owned this space. And Perl uh, had, had modules. Um, and today you see similarly that other scripting languages like Python or JavaScript um, also have module systems. And in fact, PowerShell, despite being a shell, is also very much a structured programming language. Um, and so having a module system is really an essential component of that. So um, we want this structure for uh, modules to make it uh, simpler both to for us to understand them and for there to be a unified module system in PowerShell to load them in. But uh, and also we need to understand what the, this module structure looks like because um, it's important that PowerShell has some way of finding and loading these modules in. So the simplest, a really simple module is something that, like a single script module file. It's just a, a single self-contained file. This isn't very common in the real world um, because uh, 
there are other features that um, uh, make modules more powerful within PowerShell. But a simple first step is to put this into a directory with the same name as the module, and then to give uh, this module a manifest, uh, which is written into a PSD1 file, which is this declarative um, uh, expression of all the metadata and exports uh, of the module. Um, so at this point, this is sort of, there are plenty of real world PowerShell modules like this, but because PowerShell modules are sort of these composable things, it can get much more complicated. You might add a binary uh, component or a sub module. Um, you might add uh, a, a total, a, a whole sub module, um, which is a module only to this parent module. In fact, sub modules don't have to be individual module files. They could be whole uh, directories with another manifest and uh, uh, another um, uh, script module or DLL module within it. And in fact, not everything within a PowerShell module has to be um, PowerShell code or executable. Um, you can include a, uh, a PS1 XML file, like a types or a formats PS1 XML, uh, which adds um, uh, type annotations or, uh, or extended type system entries or um, formatting system entries to uh, uh, PowerShell types in, this, in the uh, current session. Or you might even add scripts that execute when the module is imported. In fact, the, the module structure is relatively flexible, um, but uh, but the main components here are these this is uh, this, uh, this idea that a module can be composed from other modules in some way. So, understanding that this is how a module is structured, let's look at how modules are picked up off the file system, how we discover modules. Now. In order to be able to use modules in any way whatsoever, we have to be able to find them. And, you know, in a naive world, we could just require that um, users always specify their module uh, by path. They always have to know exactly where the module lives. But in an interactive sh shell, this, having to import a module every time you use it and having to do so by path, is a terrible user experience. Um, so instead, uh, an idea borrowed from other shells is that you have some uh, path variable um, that uh, has a list of directories to look in for these modules. And one question is, well, why not just reuse the existing path environment variable? It's common across uh, all the operating systems that PowerShell supports um, and other shells use it. Um, but the problem is that uh, across Windows and um, Unix-like operating systems, uh, path is often home to executables and possibly DLLs as well, and uh, ones that are not at all intended to be used as PowerShell modules. Also, path can get quite long and quite dense, and so um, it introduces the, uh, the difficulty that PowerShell is now looking through a whole thing, bunch of things not intended for use by PowerShell to inspect whether they're modules or not every time you run a command. Um, but also um, introduces the possibility of PowerShell accidentally loading something that would work as a module, but isn't really meant to do uh, to be used as such. Instead, PowerShell comes up with its own path variable, the PS module path, which works exactly the same way. So, uh, for example, here, um, two directories that PowerShell looks in um, are given by absolute path and separated with uh, a colon to indicate that they are sort of consecutive entries on this list. And uh, by default, the PS module path has a sort of a well-known structure, which is that uh, first comes, the, so the first place it looks, first uh, entry on the left is the user module directory, then the shared directory, then the directory uh, that lives under PS Home, where uh, modules that come with the PowerShell installation itself are kept. And then on Windows with PowerShell uh, 6 and up, um, on the end is tacked the Windows PowerShell module directory. That is the one under System 32. Um, and that is designed to enable uh, Windows PowerShell modules uh, that work, uh, that are needed from uh, uh, within Windows to do things that uh, are normally done with in Windows PowerShell 5.1. Um, so there's something of a scheme to these default paths. On Windows, 
uh, they uh, come from the special folders. Uh, they're a common environment concept there. But things like um, the user uh, module dir directory lives under the My Documents folder. On Unix-like operating systems, uh, these module directories live uh, under the XDG paths, um, which is a common convention for um, uh, user and shared uh, file system locations. One thing to be really conscious of is that PS module path does not work like an ordinary environment variable. Um, you can pass it around as such, and it's very much intended that you do that, but PowerShell will set it if it doesn't exist. It will try and fix it up. Um, and a lot of this is uh, essentially historical behavior. Um, and um, it can be a bit of a trap. Um, I don't want to go too much into that. Uh, and it's something that is always being discussed. Um, but it's something to very much be aware of um, because it can be, uh, it can cause issues. So let's have an example of how we search the module path for a given module. Imagine that we want to import a module uh, like this one here, my module, and we have the module path setting described here where we have three directories, first, second, and third. Uh, and on it, we need to find the my module module in order to import it. Um, so the first thing that happens is, uh, the first place we search is this first directory. And what happens is the module system uh, in PowerShell looks for a my module directory under uh, the first directory. Um, and when it doesn't find that, it immediately moves on to second. So the thing that you should take away from this is that putting a PSM1 like script module or a DLL uh, on the module path by itself without a directory will mean that that module is not looked at by PowerShell for uh, import. You can import it by absolute path, but it won't be imported off the module path. It must be in a, uh, a directory uh, of the module name. So in this case, we keep looking uh, under the second directory again for this my module directory, and this time we find it. At this point, the first thing we look for is a version directory, and this is uh, something introduced in uh, PowerShell 4 and upward for side-by-side -side, uh, version uh, module installation. Um, and in this case, we don't have such a version directory in our scenario, but when there are version directories under the same uh, segment of the module path, uh, it's worth remembering that PowerShell will always take the higher version uh, unless unless another constraint such as maximum module version has been specified. So in this case, this version directory doesn't exist. And so we begin our search through uh, module files by module file extension. And the first module file we look for is a PSD1, a module manifest file. And the reason for that is because the manifest uh, if we find one, will always tell us how to proceed with importing the whole module. And so we should always look for that first. In this case, we don't find one. And so we continue our search for a script module, a CDXML module, uh, an, an NGEND DLL, a DLL uh, binary module, and then in PowerShell 6 and upwards, an executable. And don't be too concerned if some of those uh, module extensions are a bit unusual. I'll explain them a bit later. In this case, we didn't find anything, and so we move on to the third directory on the module path. Um, and immediately we look for uh, this my module directory and find it. And we look for the versioned directory, but don't find that. So now again, we move on to looking for a manifest, but this time we find it. And so uh, the import module command uh, resolves to importing the module at this particular module path, uh, sorry, this particular path. Um, and, and so our search is done. Um, it's worth noting as well that import module is totally case insensitive on all platforms. Even though we're doing a file system lookup, um, the import module concept is a PowerShell concept and uh, PowerShell doesn't care about the casing of the name of a module. So once we've found a module, uh, we still need to load it if we're trying to import it. Um, each module kind is quite different, um, but and so the actual way in which it's loaded differs, but there is a general strategy and it's this. We create a new session state, which is kind of like um, a set of scopes. 
um, it's like a, a common runtime state. Um, then we execute that the, the module, the heart of the module, in that sort of isolated session state. Um, we create a new PS module info object, uh, which is an, again something I'll explain in a moment, uh, around this new isolated session state. We take all the things that the module exports and pass it through uh, from the isolated session state into the session state importing the module. And then we add the PS module info object into the module table of the importing session state um, so that it now registers as uh, a module that has been loaded. Um, so what is this PS module info object? Well, it's basically the um, the core of a module. It represents uh, every PowerShell module is represented by a PS module info object. Um, and it represents any kind of module, both a loaded one and an unloaded one. And so if you run import module pass through on a module, it will import the module and you will get back a PS module info object representing a live PowerShell module. And this will be very, very accurate in terms of what it describes about the module because it will actually have executed all of the module code on import. Whereas running get module list available will also give you back a PS module info object. But because the module won't be loaded, it will be PowerShell's best guess at, you know, uh, uh, at static analysis um, of uh, all of the information on that module. So it's likely to be more accurate if, for example, the module has a manifest. Um, the, the module info object has all of the information uh, about a module attached to it. Um, and so from the outside, it looks a lot like a manifest. Um, this means that um, all of the properties that you see on a module manifest will be displayed on a PS module info object. But actually under the covers, it's a lot more uh, interesting than that because the PS module info object is how PowerShell itself uh, keeps hold of the module scope and the state that that module is in. Um, that, that isolated session state that uh, introduced earlier um, lives inside a PS module info object. Um, the other kind of surprising thing about a PS module info object is that it's mutable. So if you um, get module for uh, a module that's loaded, you can change properties like the access mode and the on remove uh, field. Um, again, I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. So here's an example of uh, getting a PS module info object back from import module. Uh, and as you can see, it looks as if, almost as if you had just looked at the manifest hash table. Um, but really, there are some, there are much deeper properties, you know, internally uh, that live on this object. So let's have a look at loading an actual uh, module file. Let's start with a, a script module. It starts off simply enough by with just the PSM1 file on the file system. We create this fresh session state that we talked about, and we actually dot source the PSM1 file into that session state. First, the classes come in. Um, and the reason I treat these first is because uh, when classes are defined in PowerShell by uh, executing a script, they are attached to the session state in which they are defined. And so uh, this is kind of the origin of um, the module scope concept for classes. Um, Again, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later, but I just wanted to point it out here. We also bring in all of the other exports of this of a script module. Um, and then we uh, when that script module is run and it uh, runs export module member, um, those exports are uh, remembered to to export from the module later on. If export module member isn't run, then everything that the module defines, uh, all the functions, all the uh, aliases and all the variables, um, are exported as if export module member had been uh, executed on everything. So at this point, we have our session state and a list of all the things to export. We wrap the whole thing in a new PS module info object. We then add the exports into the importing session state. And finally, we add the PS module info object to the module table to register that the module has been imported. OK, so how about binary modules in PowerShell? Well, um, again, this is, follows the same strategy, but it, it looks quite different. So we start with the DLL. We then create this thing called an initial session state, which is effectively a blueprint for a new session state. It's not actually a live set of scopes. 
it's a it's a, a prototype to create one from. Um, at this point, we load the assembly in, and then we pass through the metadata of the loaded assembly to find. Oh, sorry. First, yeah, first we pass through the metadata of the assembly to find all types implementing an I module assembly initializer. Any of those types that we are able to instantiate, we do, and then we run the on import method. And this is really a way of um, allowing you to write a binary uh, state initializer for your module. Um, then we sift through, keep sifting through the metadata, looking for anything that implements the commandlet with the commandlet attribute um, or uh, and aliases for those commandlets uh, or parameters, of course, um, but and also things implementing PowerShell providers. All of those things are then uh, registered as uh, automatic exports of this DLL module. Remember, of course, that a DLL has no concept of uh, an export list, but rather um, uh, those can be contained later on with a manifest. Um, and those are assigned to a fresh PS module info object. Um, we then load all of the uh, exported definitions into our current session state by calling this bind method from the initial session state, which basically says flush uh, all of the context we've built up in the initial session state into the session state that we target. Um, and then finally, we add the PS module info into the module intrinsics, uh, into the module table in the current session state to register that the module has been loaded. Okay, so those are the two main forms of module in PowerShell in terms of functionality. But we've missed a really important concept, uh, which is the module manifest. Uh, and in particular, PowerShell uh, recognizes a manifest module as its own kind of module. So what is what, what, what is a module manifest and what's useful about it? Well, a module manifest is just a, a declarative hash table format uh, in PowerShell data file format, um, which contains pure metadata, things like who owns the module, um, uh, uh, lists of things that the module exports. Um, so things like commandlets to export, functions to export, aliases to export, um, things that should be processed when the module is loaded. So uh, types to process, formats to process, um, also things like required assemblies, required modules, um, and even um, scripts to process. So scripts that are executed when the module, when the manifest module is loaded. Um, constraints on the loading platform, so things like a minimum PowerShell version or a required PowerShell host. Um, the private data field is particularly interesting because even though it is in a sense pure metadata and better than that, unlike other uh, fields, it's entirely up, uh, it's entirely free form. Uh, users can, uh, module authors can write any data they like in there without breaking the manifest format. Um, this is actually used by some other PowerShell tooling, such as PowerShell Get, um, uh, PowerShell Experimental Features, and uh, PowerShell's um, semantic version support. Um, manifests allow modules to have a recursive structure as well. And so um, you can redirect the central uh, module file within a, uh, within a module using the root module property. And you can even use nested modules to specify that this module has sub modules that are modular to it. Finally, the compatible PS additions field is in most circumstances a pure metadata field, but for, partic for particular modules that uh, Microsoft ships with Windows that live under the Windows PowerShell System 32 module path, uh, PowerShell 6 and above actually pays attention to this field to determine whether or not that module has been marked as compatible by adding core to the compatible PS additions field. So how do we actually load uh, a module manifest? Well, the answer is, I mean, a bit long winded, but that's to be expected. This is actually represents part of this uh, implementation represents the longest and most complex uh, method in the PowerShell code base. It's over 2000 lines long. Uh, but it's effectively just reading through uh, consecutive fields in uh, a PowerShell hash table uh, file and, and linking them up. So we read the PSD1 file. How? Well, we actually execute it in a PowerShell language mode called restricted language mode, which allows almost no invocations. It is effectively a language mode that only allows a constant hash table uh, uh, expression to be executed. 
<clears throat> from this point, we take the hash table that is defined by this and we read all of the pure metadata fields and we uh, shove them into a new empty PS module info object. Um, we do the same thing with the private data field, um, but again, just noting that there are uh, certain elements of the private data field under the PS data subfield uh, with particular relevance to things both within PowerShell and uh, that live sort of very close to PowerShell, like the experimental feature system and PowerShell get. Um, then we see if we're able to proceed or not with the uh, module import by reading through all of the import constraints. Some things like PowerShell version and PowerShell host name are enforced everywhere, but some things uh, after the move to uh, .NET Core with PowerShell 6 and onwards are no longer feasible to enforce. So .NET Framework version and CLR version uh, are meaningful in Windows PowerShell. And so you can uh, specify that your module only works with uh, .NET Framework version 4, 7 and above. But in PowerShell Core, that doesn't really make sense, especially because PowerShell Core's .NET, uh, reported .NET version right now is 3.1. Uh, 3 and so these checks now serve as uh, pure metadata for PowerShell 6, but ensure that um, your module won't be uh, loaded inappropriately in Windows PowerShell. We also at this point look at the compatible PS additions field uh, and in PowerShell 6 and above, if the module has come from the Windows PowerShell module directory under system 32, um, then uh, the module's compatibility with uh, PowerShell 6 and above will be evaluated uh, and the module import may fail if it does not declare that it's compatible with PowerShell uh, with, with the core runtime. Um, but for most modules, certainly for almost every module, uh, for, for any module authored outside of Microsoft, this field uh, is purely a metadata field intended to signal to um, module users uh, the intended compatibility of the module. Then the export uh, lists are read through, um, and these are effectively filters, um, but uh, which I'll speak to about in a moment. But uh, at this point, we just read those lists in. We don't actually run the exports yet, uh, because first we have to do things like load the required modules into the current session state if there are any. Um, <clears throat> if there are any fields that require um, special processing, um, like uh, formats and types to process or required assemblies. We actually create a new initial session state. Um, we add these to the initial session state. And then when the fresh session state is, uh, is created to load the module into, um, this is uh, created in part using any initial session state to, to in order to process uh, and load any of the requirements from the module. If there are no requirements, then we just create a blank fresh session state. There's no need for the initial session state. Um, at this point, we run any scripts to process that the uh, module defines. Uh, any nested modules are imported and brought into that uh, into the fresh module session state. Um, if root module is specified, it changes uh, in many ways how the import uh, works. Um, both because the manifest is no longer the root of the module, but also because it changes um, what the central file of the module is from a metadata perspective. And so we import the root module if one is specified, but we also change the type and path to the module uh, according to the module metadata uh, that the PS module info reports. <clears throat> we put all of these things together into a PS module info uh, object ready to be loaded into PowerShell. We then flush any of the exports through the export list. That is to say that if your module, uh, if your underlying root module or nested modules have um, more things, uh, export more things than are specified in the export list, then um, anything not specified in the export list, uh, for example, in commandlets to uh, ex uh, export um, will not be exported because it doesn't appear in the list. Um, you might be familiar with the pattern of using a star dash star wildcard uh, in uh, functions to export for your module to keep um, 
commands without hyphens in them internal. That's exactly what happens here. Um, so we flush the exports out. Um, we then add the PS module info into the module table of the importing session state. Um, and then we finally uh, register the exported uh, members in the, the importing session state ready for use by, uh, by the caller of import module. So there are a couple of other unusual module types in PowerShell, um, which I'll sort of gloss over a little bit here. Um, PS1 scripts can be used like modules, but this is for all intents and purposes, just like dot sourcing. The only difference is that it adds a dummy PS module info to the module table. That PS module info records no exports and removing the module doesn't unexport or undot source any of the PS1 file. Um, all it does is register the fact that this PS1 file was dot sourced uh, using import module and so records that at some point import module was run on this file. Um, these, uh, there's also the .ni.dll ngend DLL binary modules. These are just DLLs that have been compiled ahead of time uh, for performance reasons on Windows. Um, they behave exactly like DLLs, but we prefer them. We look for them first because they tend to be faster. Well, the intent is that they are faster. CDXML, uh, you might have heard of it, but if you haven't, is effectively uh, a way to specify a PowerShell interface around SIM or WMI uh, APIs on Windows um, and uh, is an XML format. When a CDXML uh, module is loaded within PowerShell, uh, it actually uh, goes through a uh, piece of logic called the script writer that turns the XML into a script module at load time uh, and then loads uh, the script as a module. Finally, executables uh, have been uh, are enabled at, for, as modules in PowerShell 6 and above. But that doesn't mean arbitrary executables. It only means um, ones written uh, with using .NET. And it works exactly the same as a DLL. Why are executables um, uh, modules in uh, usable as modules in PowerShell? Well, it means that um, if you, you can deploy the same tool as both uh, an executable and a module for PowerShell, but it also means that uh, you can, uh, that, that something that is a sort of a, a hammer as an executable can be used in a more fine grained way uh, from PowerShell by simply importing it and calling into the APIs directly. So we've talked about all of this sort of strange session state stuff and uh, this plays well into the uh, into the fact that modules have scope and in fact this scope owes itself the scope concept owes itself entirely to this uh, set these fresh session states that we create when importing a module so <clears throat> when you load a module it's loaded into this fresh session state which uh, only exports required exports into the uh, importing session state the session state is effectively a context for scopes um, so it stores um, the uh, state of definitions of things. It's kind of like a run space, but whereas a run space you can think of as um, uh, sort of a PowerShell thread, this is like PowerShell memory in some respect. Um, so um, each uh, session state contains function definitions, script variables, and of course classes. Uh, that are associated with it. Um, and when you run a PowerShell, uh, a, 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 a command exported from a PowerShell module, um, it will try to resolve any of the commands or variables or classes that it, uh, uh, that it needs to run from within its own module scope before looking into the calling scope. Um, and this is all very much intended behavior. Um, it's designed to keep mod to, to provide a way for modules to separate their in internal implementation from uh, things going on in the calling context. Um, you can actually look into this um, using uh, this ampersand module info script block uh, syntax here, um, but uh, it's really not recommended. It's intended for debugging. 
um, uh, because you know this is effectively the same as doing reflection um, on something that's internal, right? Um, if you if you really need to use something like this in a uh, on an ongoing basis, you should ideally export it. Um, so let's look at an example of how module scope works. Here's a definition on the left of two simple functions, func and invoke func. Uh, and invoke func just runs the function uh, func. And when we run it normally, invoke func, um, then the calling scope uh, calls invoke func, and invoke func calls func. And uh, at this point, func uh the actual command that func resolves to depends on this um call uh, the call time stack and so func looks up the stack and it finds this func definition that we have uh that we provided in the uh, top level scope and so it resolves to a but in powershell we have this concept of dynamic scope that means that um even though uh something like func can be defined uh, here and referred to uh, in the same scope here, really what func is uh, resolves to depends on uh, the runtime stack when the script block is invoked. So uh, in this script, invoke with new func takes a script block, then puts it in a new context where func has a shadow implementation that returns B, and then invokes the script block within that scope. <clears throat> So uh, when we call invoke with new func, the calling scope has these three definitions in it, including the uh, func a uh, uh, function. Uh, but then within invoke with new func, there's a second definition of func, which returns b. The script block itself is actually its own scope, um, uh, but with no definitions in it. You can see that the, the script block that we're passing in only contains uh, the call to func. And finally, uh, the call to func itself uh, has to resolve to something, and it looks up the call stack again. Um, and the first definition of func it finds is actually the func returning B, this func here. That's dynamic scope in PowerShell, um, and which, which is, separates it somewhat from other languages with lexical uh, scope. Um, but uh, this is kind of a problem because it means that no matter where you call uh, your uh, function uh, internally, it always, uh, details from the outside world always sort of bleed in. There's no way to, um, uh, there's not necessarily a way to uh, keep, uh, uh, so, uh, 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 we can't define what, uh, what in other languages is called a closure, where um, some internal state detail is kept uh, is, it influences the result, but isn't exposed to the outside world. The outside world plays a very big role in how we evaluate funk. <clears throat> and so one of the sort of uh, things that happens with modules, both the consequence of the session state uh, that modules use, but also sort of by design to allow internal definitions, is uh, the way module scope works. Again, here we have our function funk, uh, and uh, sort of an outside, you know, uh, implementation calling it. But we also have a, um, a module that we define here that defines its own func implementation and defines a, a function that um, calls that calls func, whichever func it is. Um, and when we import this module and then we invoke module func, uh, which is to say we invoke the command within func module or exported by func module, um, that um, uh, uh, calls some func command, the following happens. A calling scope defines func A and invoke func. Um, and when it calls invoke module func, the first scope it actually passes through is the func module scope. So the scope that we created when we imported this func module scope, uh, func module module. Um, then there's the invoke module func scope. And finally, there's the func call itself. And when func is called by invoke module func, it searches up the call stack. Um, and the first func definition it finds is actually the module scope one. 
And the reason for this is because module scope is always preferred by um, uh, by commands exported by modules. And even if we uh, added an export module member function invoke module func here, um, so that this func is never exported by um, uh, by the func module module, um, invoke module func would still return module on the basis that uh, within module scope that is what func returns to uh, resolves to. Okay, similar to this, uh, PowerShell classes also are coupled in uh, in some ways to module scope. Um, <clears throat> the interaction here is rather complex because um, classes are implemented to be .NET types. Um, this means that uh, you know, so so you might expect, like all other .NET types in PowerShell, um, that uh, classes uh, exist as sort of in a global scope because um, assemblies, once loaded into PowerShell, exist. You know, their types are universally available. But in fact, in PowerShell, classes are scoped, and particularly they're scoped to modules. In fact, they're actually scoped to the session state that they are defined in. Um, why? Why is this? Why is it that classes, even though they define .NET types, are scoped, but not other .NET types? Well, the answer is that uh, PowerShell classes can use state from the session state that they live in. They might depend on functions or variables defined in uh, the session state in which they are defined. And so they are coupled to their scope in general. Um, and so in order to uh, make this concept work, um, PowerShell type resolution has uh, logic in it to work out uh, what class or whether a class uh, type should resolve uh, in a particular execution uh, in, in a particular execution and to what class that uh, type uh, expression should resolve. Um, another thing that happens with classes uh, in, in PowerShell in general, but is particularly pertinent in modules, is this uh, this sort of mixed functionality where classes run at par, uh, are uh, defined at parse time um, rather than at module import time. Um, so, um, because classes are designed to be highly compatible with .NET, in fact, you can define true .NET types using PowerShell classes, and because they're defined to be performant, classes are actually compiled into a dynamic .NET assembly uh, when the script is when a script containing a, a class definition or a type definition is passed. <clears throat> Basically, this is an expensive operation um, to compile the class into uh, .NET IL, but if we can guarantee that it only happens once, we can make classes very fast in the long run by taking a hit up front. And the way we guarantee that this, uh, that we minimize the expense of this is by uh, making um, uh, it's only compiled once, and that's when the script is passed. And so an issue that occurs here is that um, classes uh, are parsed before um, any commands are run, including import module. And the problem here is that if you import a module with a base type in it uh, and into a script that tries to uh, implement a type depending on that base type, it won't succeed because the the dependent type uh, will try to be, uh, PowerShell will try to define the dependent type before it's able to import the module defining defining the base class. The solution to both of these issues is to use using module. Um, so again, let me give you an example. Say you begin with a really simple class like animal and you define it in a module called module.psm1. Um, one common uh, desire is to import the class from this module and then uh, refer to the animal type. Well, unfortunately, this isn't going to work uh, because import module is not designed to uh, to associate the module uh, that it, the classes in the module that it is importing with the importing session state. And so type resolution does not occur for the animal type after import module is run on the module that defines the class. <clears throat> Similarly, in a case where we try to define a subclass of animal um, be, uh, uh, after importing the animal type from 
the, uh, from module.psm1, um, we hit an issue where uh, cat will present as a type error because it is actually parsed first by PowerShell. And PowerShell will do a type check where it tries to, def uh, to find animal, but can't find it yet because import module hasn't executed. The cat class is uh, defined as a type at compile time, which happens before execution time when import module is run. So hopefully that's not too complicated, but even if it is, here's a simple solution. Instead, when using classes with PowerShell modules, um, using module allows you to uh, uh, provides a mechanism to hook up the module that you are importing from uh, with the importing session state. And so when we use using module module.psm1, it allows uh, it brings in uh, the animal type before um, uh, or ahead of compilation of uh, the the main script that we're running, and so allowing us to define a class cat that inherits from animal. It also links the module.psm1 session state with the calling session state, so that the calling session state knows how to resolve the animal type uh, by looking uh, by looking at the appropriate class definition within module.psm1. So we've talked a lot about uh, module scopes now uh, and, and how modules get imported, but um, most of the time you don't want to import the module yourself. Uh, having to run import module to find the commands that you want is not a very good interactive shell experience. <clears throat> Instead, it would be much nicer, just like in bash, just like in CMD, um, to simply execute the command and let the underlying shell uh, implicitly load uh, the desired command implementation. An issue here is that utils, like I said before, are one-to-one -one with files on the file system. It's very easy to look up a util by name based on the path environment variable <clears throat> and then just translate uh, the invocation into uh, a path-based uh, execution. With modules, on the other hand, there is no such thing and it uh, there is no such correspondence and we have to uh, analyze modules uh, to find what commands are exported so we know which module to load to provide the implementation for commands as they are invoked in PowerShell. <clears throat> this uh, somewhat complicated algorithm is handled in PowerShell by the command discovery uh, class and some affiliated logic. Um, but it's it boils down to searching the command table in the current session state to determine what uh, commands are already loaded which is to say what commands are already provided by currently loaded modules so that we don't have to do any searching on the file system at all. And if that doesn't happen, we uh, turn to module auto loading or technically we turn to module auto, uh, uh, auto well, we turn to module auto discovery to determine which module a command comes from and auto loading to automatically load that module. And this is a necessary distinction because uh, PowerShell is actually configurable to uh, uh, to determine uh, to what extent it should try to perform auto discovery and auto loading. So let's look at an example. Say I want to run invoke script analyzer. It would be very easy for me to run import module ps script analyzer and then invoke script analyzer, but it wouldn't be very ergonomic. Um, instead, I would much prefer to just run invoke script analyzer at the prompt. Uh, again, like before, let's assume that I have a PS module path in three parts and that this PS module path, uh, these three directories on the PS module path each contain three directories. We're going to need to search through these uh, six directories in order to find the uh, PS script analyzer. Um, so uh, this is where the command discovery logic comes in. Um, and you can see here that there is an analysis cache. Um, PowerShell holds an in-memory cache of all of the uh, module analysis it's done in order to improve the performance of module uh, import, uh, module module auto loading, as well as module completion, uh, command completions from uh, modules that live on the module path. Um, 
Part of this relies on script analysis, which is a way of statically analyzing modules without actually executing them in order to work out what they export. And part of it is this file system cache, which PowerShell keeps on the file system so that all of the analysis that is done uh, in any session is persisted to the next session, again, to improve performance. <clears throat> so for example, let's say that, um, oh, well, first of all, um, I should tell you that uh, this file system cache uh, location is actually configurable by users. You can set it using the PS module analysis cache path environment variable. That's pretty unusual. Um, I've never actually seen anybody that uh, used it, but uh, if you're in a bind, it does offer some um, extra configuration for you. When we uh, first try to resolve modules, uh, sorry, commands for, from modules, this file system cache is loaded into the analysis cache to populate its data. Um, and in this case, let's imagine that we've already got an entry for this mod A module. Um, and we know from the analysis cache, uh, we, we look it up in the analysis cache and we determine that it does not uh, export script analyzer. Um, now, every time we look in the analysis cache, it also looks at the file to make sure that the analysis cache is up to date with the last uh, time the file was modified. So, but in this case, we've done that and we've determined that module uh, that mod A does not export invoke, uh, invoke script analyzer command. We might then look at, uh, uh, we might then find this PSM1 file, but remember of course that PSM1 files, in fact any module file that is in a directory on the module path, is not uh, a candidate for uh, module auto loading or module completion. It, the only way to access the uh, <clears throat> implementation of this module is to import it directly by path. So we just skip over this file. Um, in the case of module C, uh, this module either doesn't exist yet or it's been modified since our last uh, caching of its analysis result. And so uh, our call to the analysis cache um, has to go up to the script analysis logic in order to determine whether this module exports script uh, the invoke script analyzer command or not. The script analysis call returns um, it's determined that it doesn't export invoke script analyzer, but not only do we use that result now, we also asynchronously write this information back to the PowerShell uh, file system script analysis cache. Um, again, there's another directory on the module path under this uh, second directory under the second path. Um, and because it's a directory, we're forced to acknowledge the possibility that it could be a module, but uh, uh, the logic here simply looks for some kind of module implementation within this directory, determines it doesn't have one, and passes over it. Finally, we find the script analyzer module, um, and the analysis cache reports that this does indeed export invoke script analyzer. You might wonder why we had to look through all of these modules, uh, modules in order to work out that this result we already had cached was the one that applied uh, was the one that was relevant for the command we needed to uh, execute. The answer is that the file system is always subject to change. We could have installed a new module on the module path. We could have changed the module path. The only way to know for sure uh, whether the module system state, uh, or the module resolution state will turn up the same result is to look over the file system. The difference, the, the part that we're able to cache is not um, where commands live, but rather um, what the exports of particular modules living at known paths are. And even that is time boxed by um, whether the analysis cache is um, as fresh as the last modified result, uh, the last modified time on that uh, module file. Okay, so once we've identified uh, what module this uh, invoke script analyzer command comes from, we're able to, uh, we, PowerShell implicitly imports it under the hood and then is able to uh, invoke it as was originally intended by uh, the scripter. Um, <clears throat> so there is some configuration here. You can turn this entire behavior off by setting the PS module auto loading preference variable, not an environment variable, an ordinary uh, automatic variable, um, to none. Uh, when this is set like this, um, there, there will never be a lookup. There will never be an import module call. You will be forced to run import module in order to run any command. 
This might sound like uh, an unhelpful option, but it can force you to run uh, to import things ahead of time, particularly in scripts, which can optimize the speed that those scripts will execute with. Um, similarly, you can also set this preference variable to module qualified. This forces you to disambiguate your uh, command calls to module qualified form. It will still uh, load the module, but you have to specify which module to load first. This is good because it can uh, eliminate issues with command uh, ambiguity. It's also good because it can speed up the uh, command uh, discovery logic by allowing it to skip over any modules that don't match uh, the provided module name. So a big component of this is the um, script, uh, the module analysis uh, that has to be performed in order to determine what exports uh, a module provides. Um, we need to know these uh, these exports in order to be able to auto load a module or even to provide completions uh, for commands that modules export based on their presence on the module path. But this is very hard to do because the only real way to know what a module exports is to execute it. Um, in a script module, for example, export module member must be run physically um, uh, in order to uh, export the, the members of the uh, that, that module provides. Um, and similarly, in a DLL uh, for a binary module, the uh, assembly must be loaded in order to um, in order to work out what uh, commandlets and providers that module uh, exports. We don't have an obvious solution to this beyond static analysis. And so um, even though we do run uh, with script files, we run static analysis. Uh, with DLLs, in fact, we, we only look at a manifest. And if there is no manifest, that the module uh, for auto loading and completion uh, purposes is considered to not export anything at all. Um, but there are obvious limitations with the script analysis part. Um, export module member, because it's an ordinary PowerShell command, um, can take uh, any input, and that input could be conditional. Um, in manifests, uh, if you don't explicitly uh, state which commands, which commandlets, functions, variables, aliases are exported, but instead use a wildcard, then the wildcard forces PowerShell to look at the underlying module to work out what its exports are. Um, this works, like I say, this works with a script module, but it it uh, but it is more time consuming. And with a binary module, it doesn't work at all. Um, and even with binary modules, we uh, loading these assemblies is dangerous because uh, we uh, because it's possible to execute code from a, a .NET assembly just by loading it in. And so not wanting to change machine state without you explicitly importing the module, or at least implicitly importing the module, we have to revert to this static analysis. That means <clears throat> if you can write more information into your manifest about what your module exports, then things are going to get faster and easier. Um, PowerShell always trusts the module manifest, so um, being explicit is helpful to uh, performance and to discovery. <clears throat> so if you end up writing a script module like this, you may have an issue. Um, you can see here that there's this test only on Windows function. And um, if this particular registry uh, key has a certain value, um, then we add, uh, only then do we add this export to the export list for, uh, uh, for this script module. Um, now, when uh, script module analysis is run, there is some degree of constant folding, but it can't do something like uh, work out what the value in the registry is going to be. And so in this case, test only on Windows, this function will never be auto loaded um, and you won't get completions for it unless you specify a manifest for this module with no wildcards in it. That is to say, unless you declare upfront in your manifest that this is exported. So finally, let's talk about um, removing modules. This is actually surprisingly simple in PowerShell. There's really only one way to do it. Um, and that's because module removal should be quite explicit. 
whereas modules essentially don't exist for the purposes of finding them or importing them, um, you really only want to, rem uh, you know, only the user can know if they're done using a module or if they want to remove it. And uh, they can specify that by running the remove module command. Um, modules have hooks on them that uh, allow you to allow the module author to configure code to run when the module is removed. Um, but be aware that when you remove a module, you cannot remove the un underlying assemblies. Uh, once you've imported a module that brings .NET types into uh, the global session state, uh, you cannot get rid of them uh, without shutting down the process. Um, classes, you might argue, are um, also types, but uh, classes are actually implemented uh, in the those special dynamic assemblies, which are unloadable in .NET Core. Um, and so when you unload, uh, when you remove a module that imports a, uh, that, that defines a PowerShell class, those classes get cleaned up when it's removed. Um, you can actually prevent users from removing your module by setting this access mode property on it. I really don't recommend that. I've never really seen a good use for that. Um, I, but I, I felt like I should mention that it is possible. So removing modules, you know, it simply enough works like this. When the remove module command is run, uh, the if that module, the PS module info object has the on remove script block set, then that will be executed. And that can do any kind of stateful cleanup that you like. It's it's written in PowerShell. And so um, this actually does get used a fair amount in, in PowerShell. Um, after that, if it's a binary module uh, and it defines any uh, types to, uh, that implement the I module assembly cleanup interface, then those types will be instantiated and the on remove method run. This isn't tends not to be quite as useful as the uh, uh, the script block, but it's still uh, useful enough uh, for when you need to dispose or otherwise tear down internal module state. Once those have been run, uh, we take all of the exports from the module that we need to remove and we remove them from the current session state. And then finally, we deregister the module for, uh, as imported from the module table. Um, and now the module is effectively gone. So uh, that's all the all of the details I, I wanted to cover in this talk. Um, but as a summary, modules are basically the gateway to all of the power in PowerShell. Um, most of the useful uh, work that happens in PowerShell happens through something exported from a module. Um, and the rest of it, you know, is mainly there as, as, as glue to make life easier. Um, modules are one of PowerShell's key ways of providing structure, of uh, keeping the internal separate from the external, of keeping things namespaced and cohesive. Um, modules are PowerShell's solution to something like object orientation or um, you know, a, a way to make sure that all the state isn't just jumbled in together in, in, uh, in your sort of command line state. Um, hopefully you've seen from this uh, talk that when you press tab for an auto completion, when you press uh, enter to run a command, there's a lot that happens under the hood in PowerShell uh, to make that work. Um, and when it doesn't work, or even if you're trying to do something that, you know, works the way it should, but you're not quite sure what, you know, whether that is the way it should, it helps to know uh, how modules work on a deeper level, um, because you can get a better read of whether the right thing is happening or uh, what you might need to change about your own module to make it work nicely within PowerShell. Because modules are, you know, quite complicated um, and for all kinds of strange reasons. Um, but uh, there's often a way to get things done. Um, they are, you know, they are complicated, but they're also very uh, feature laden. So a couple of final recommendations. Um, if you know you're going to need the commands ahead of time, use import module. Not so much in an interactive experience, but if you're writing a script, uh, especially one that uh, you know, you're going to invoke over and over on different machines. Import module is going to uh, speed it, you know, it's going to prevent PowerShell from having to do any stra strange module lookup to uh, find where the implementation of your commands lives. Um, 
Also, if you're writing a module, write a module manifest and don't use wildcards. That prevents PowerShell from having to do script analysis, which makes importing uh, and discoverability faster and easier for everyone. And that's the end. Um, and there's my bio tab. <laughs> Thank you for uh, having me at PSConf EU, and hopefully I'll see you in person next year. <laughs>